Hello, movie lovers. Today I'm going to continue on with my uh, series of films from 1972. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this month of April 2022, I'm, I'm covering what I've termed the European auteurs, uh, the European art film. I'm not real satisfied with the way I termed that. I, I, I think what these directors were were basically visionaries. They had a specific view of cinema and, and uh, how they wanted to express themselves through cinema. Um, that was very true to themselves. So when I, uh, a few days ago, I, I, I uh, that's the Fellini box set, and I talked about Roma. And in Roma, Fellini actually appears uh, in, in, in a couple scenes. And in one, he's being interviewed by a bunch of radicals. Italy is in a almost a socially chaotic condition in 1972. And, they urge him, why don't you make films that are relevant, that are about the society around you and the problems that we're facing? And Fellini responds, well, I can only make movies that are true to my own nature. And I think that's true of all these. There, there's, they, by expressing their own nature, they've struck on something universal. So 50 years later, these movies look as new and as modern as ever. They're, they're not dated whatsoever. Um, so um, in, uh, in The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kent, uh, filmed by Rainer Werner Fassbinder, is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, he is certainly a visionary. Uh, he had a very specific view of cinema. Uh, it was something new, something different, a distillation of influences, to be sure. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it, it, he, he, and he made, it, he made Two other, I think he made one other feature in 1972 I'll talk about later this year, which is The Merchant of Four Seasons. I think he did a TV, Eight, eight Hours Don't Make a Day, I, th I think it was called. I think that was in 72. He was very prolific, hardworking, <laughs> to say the least. The, this is a Criterion release, by the way. Um, and and Petra von Kant is a, what the Germans call a uh, Kammerspiel a chamber drama. It takes place in one set, the bedroom of Petra von Kant. Um, and, uh, and we see her, the opening, the shades are being um, let open and, and Petra's in bed. The bed is a major prop in the film, uh, considering that it's only one set. Uh, and we see her servant, her secretary servant, Marlena. Marlena is played by Erm Herman. A long time, all the actors in, in Fassbinder's films appear in many, many of, of, of his films. Now Marlena is not just a servant, she's sort of Petra's slave. They have sort of a sadomasochistic kind of relationship and, uh, you know, do this, do that, chop, chop. Um, and she never speaks. Marlena never speaks. She's as haunting a presence as you're ever going to find in a, in a movie. Who is this woman? She's sort of a stand-in for the audience. I've read, and, and I think that's kind of true. I read that in some of the research I did uh, on the movie. Uh, and then comes Hana Shigula, another uh, mainstay actress of, uh, of, of uh, Fassbender's troupe. And Petra is played by uh, Margaret Karstensen. Um, and she's laying in bed, uh, and she gets introduced to, uh, uh, by a common friend, introduced to Petra, uh, and uh, Petra immediately falls in love with her. And she comes from a working class background. Uh, Petra, it's, it's sort of implied, comes from the wealthier classes. So we have this class dynamic that we often see in Thospinders, especially in, in the love relationships. Uh, different classes, the mix of different classes, and she immediately fall, falls in love with her. But now we, uh, I, she's going to take uh, uh, the Hannah Shmuley character under her wing. She's going to make her a model. She's beautiful. Uh, she'll be successful. But Fassbender's movies are about the power dynamics of relationships, uh, the strong and the weak. One, one, uh, one person loves the strongest. The other person loves, but much weaker, uh, and what that leads to, where where the victimizer sometimes becomes the victim, and vice versa. There's always this longing for love, uh, the impossibility. Is it even possible? Love even possible? And it, it's such an intense experience, and especially for Petra von Kant, 
and it's bittersweet, you know, it's the, the joy of the love and then this despair, I'm the, you don't really love me kind of thing. And Fassbinder found beauty in despair, and this turns off a lot of people because, uh, we, you know, we want to be happy. Love should, should, should enrich our lives, not fill us with despair. Uh, uh, but again, the accent is on the bittersweet. And, and in the, one of the supplements, which is with the cinematographer Michael Bauhaus, um, uh, a great interview where he's, he talks about working with uh, Fassbinder and what he loved about working with Fassbinder was that Fassbinder always thought in terms of images. The, and, and so all this despair is counterpointed by these beautiful images and the, the framing of the actors. And uh, there's this giant painting in the wall of Petra's bedroom. It's uh, I, I, some classical painting, you know, with naked bodies and it looks like they're in post-debauchery uh, <laughs> uh, mode and, 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 and Bajos' camera will frame different elements, different segments of, the, uh, of that painting with the, in the background of, of the characters in the foreground. But not only the images, it's Fassbinder's use of music. He loved Hollywood, he loved American pop culture, he loved American pop music. So he uses such things as uh, the platter's smoke gets in your eyes. Uh, in My Room by the Walker Brothers. He puts in a bit of Verdi to get some classical uh, some uh, classical music into the mix. And then he ends <clears throat> the, la the final scene, uh, it, which is absolutely stunning. I, you know, it just will, it, it's, I don't even know how, yeah, I could, I'm not gonna describe it, but I don't think I could. But he uses The Great Pretender as the background for that. And Fassbinder, you have to. Whenever you talk about a Fassbinder film, you got to talk about um, uh, Bertolt Brecht, uh, his influence on Fassbinder. This uh, uh, where, where the audience is the alienation rather than identification. We don't identify. We don't be, see. Oh, I could be this character. I could be that character. And then you feel vicariously. Uh, you have the melodrama, but you see it from a distance. Uh, you you see it as as, uh, as something that you are going to think about, not just feel the situations that the characters are in. And of course, the other <clears throat> uh, great influence on Fassbinder in recent, is, in terms of bitter tears, is uh, Douglas Sirk. The films of Douglas Sirk he discovered uh, in the first film, *The Merchant of Four Seasons*, is a, is a, the first of his Sirkian films. And this bitter, *Bitter Tears* of Peter Van Camp for sure. Uh, Fassbender loved Barbara Stanwyck and uh, Betty Davis. He loved these strong women, and they they, they pop up throughout a, throughout his movies. Um, but with with Cirque, you had the melodrama that ha also had this sort of social uh, critique, um, in the sense that people are kind of prisoners of the history that they're living in the conventions, and they have to conform. And, and Cirque was living in the and making movies in, in the 1950s America, which was is a conformist in era as there probably ever was in American society, and um, and uh, repressive and uh, and Cirque didn't have uh, I guess there's happy endings, but some of those endings are are, are, are just are, are Fassbinder, you know, if I could say it that way. Uh, because Fassbinder thought that was the deceit of American movies, that, that people wanted to feel good. They wanted to feel good about love. It was, uh, love is enriching. It doesn't fill with despair the way Fassbinder viewed it. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and, and, the, and Petra von Kant uh, also is, is very autobiographical to Fassbinder's own life. It was uh, based on a relationship that he had with the genders now reversed, Fassbinder being bisexual, and, uh, uh, and, and also his relationship with Marlena, Mar the Marlena character who never speaks, uh, played by Erm Herman. She always, she often played, uh, and maybe not always, but she uh, would play these characters who are abused by other characters, and she had a very uh, uh, long-term relationship with Fassbinder. Uh, she could never understand the homosexuality. She, she says in the interview, she's interviewed in a couple, uh, one of the supplements, and, Mar and Margaret Carsonson, who played Petra in many other films with Fassbinder also, because he had such 
uh, uh, sexual attraction for them. He, he seemed so masculine. He seemed so powerful. He was always in the moment. He can be so manipulative. He loved to play games with many of the actors. Um, <clears throat> but he had this dual side to him where he could be sadistic and then he could be uh, emphatic. And, um, and, and they were all drawn to him. And he demanded loyalty. He felt betrayed if they wanted to go off and make movies with other directors. Uh, he had to have his way. Um, but it was hard in, in, in these interviews, these actresses in the supplements, uh, they really uh, express what Fassbender was because what Fassbender was is in the movies, especially Hannah Shagula, who uh, Fassbender treated well, but she, she was always disappointed because he was always casting her against type. She was a brainy. Uh, high, uh, college student, she dropped out of acting, she didn't really have that much ambition to be an actress, but he saw something in her, and he was always, you know, uh, casting her as some needy love. She never, in real life, Hannah Shabula never married. She knew as a young child, she said, I knew I was never going to be married. I've never, I didn't, she wasn't attracted to this possessiveness that Fassbender the possessiveness of of, uh, of, uh, of of relationships that Fassbender was so fascinated with and haunted him, and uh, um, so uh, and we we also and this was a play uh, about a year before, and, and Margaret Carstensen played Petra in the in the uh, in the theater, uh, but it was a big flop. Audiences didn't like it. it, it uh, the Feminists didn't like it. It showed uh, lesbians, you know, as, 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 as uh, over the top, full of despair, uh, no happiness, um, kind of like it was a, a disease. Um, but Fassbender is at, is is not, you know, he 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 doesn't see characters like that. He sees them as individual human beings, and what he's trying to get is the human condition, not the condition of one specific identity. Um, and this is all expressed as again, as I say, in the uh, in in the supplements, and um, well worth checking out. There's about two hour supplements. There's a whole one hour documentary where we hear, which is basically hearing the actresses and their reminiscences and what of Fassbender, their experiences with them, and how meaningful it was in their life, and how strange and unusual it was. But, and sometimes, like uh, you know, they would say, "What are we doing? Is this this is?" They they would be perplexed by the movies, and they didn't really agree themselves with what Fassbender was doing. But they were always uh, eager to go along with whatever he wanted. And now, looking back, they they see the films in a totally different light. As as I was afraid, I was in in the nineteen seventies. I was a Fassbender acolyte. I was uh, you know I would drive a hundred miles to see uh, a, a hard to see Fassbender movie in a re some renowned uh, repertory theater. Uh, he he had a grip on me. The charisma of his his character in real life comes through. So the power and the strength and he was it was almost like he was giving a, a beautiful gift to people in his movies and, I, and it just uh, overwhelmed me in my, when I was in my 20s and 30s. But as often as the case when you get older and you look back on the things that you had such an intense experience with, you wonder, is it still going to be there? You're going to be disappointed and you're always kind of afraid that you're going to be disappointed. But I wasn't with this movie. This was uh, this was <laughs> this was a powerful experience. Uh, I watched it a couple of nights ago, and I, it went, as I say, the closing shot is just so incredible that I had I had to just like sit there and you know for a bit. I I, I couldn't get back into uh, you know my normal routine of life. So what that means is. Uh, you, for anybody who follows my channel uh, with any regularity, you're going to see a lot of Fassbender movies coming up because uh, I'm not reluctant anymore to revisit. Uh, the floodgates are open. Uh, <clears throat> so next up will be in this series will be Ingmar Bergman's Cries and Whispers. Um, and then I'll be doing uh, Louis Bunuel's Wells' uh, uh, The Street Charm and the Bourgeois. And I'll complete the, the six film series of European Orchards. Okay, thanks a lot to everybody who managed to listen to me. I really appreciate it. Comments are welcome. Take care.